You are about to embark upon the great crusade. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Welcome back to the Army Flashcards Ranger School podcast. I'm your host, Zach Wiley. This is the second to last chapter in the Ranger Handbook, so we are almost done. This chapter is Chapter 14, Aviation. As always, check out armyflashcards.com if you get a chance. And with that, let's begin. Chapter 14, Aviation. Army aviation and infantry units can be fully integrated with other members of the Combined Arms Team to form powerful and flexible air assault task force. These forces can project combat power throughout the depth and width of the modern battlefield with little regard for terrain barriers, making these combat operations deliberate, precisely planned, and vigorously executed. They strike the enemy when and where they are most vulnerable. Reverse Planning Sequence 14-1 Successful air assault execution is based on a careful analysis of METTC and detailed, precise reverse planning. Five basic plans that comprise the reverse planning sequence are developed for each air assault operation. The battalion is the lowest level that has sufficient personnel to plan, coordinate, and control air assault operations. When company size or lower operations are conducted, most of the planning occurs at the battalion or higher headquarters. The five plans are ground tactical plan, landing plan, air movement plan, loading plan, staging plan. 14-2 The commander's ground tactical plan forms the foundation of a successful air assault operation. All additional plans support this plan. It specifies actions in the objective area to accomplish the mission and addresses subsequent operations. 14-3 The landing plan supports the ground tactical plan. This plan outlines a sequence of events that allows elements to move into the area of operations, ensures that units arrive at designated locations at prescribed times, and that as soon as they arrive, they are prepared to execute the ground tactical plan. 14-4 The air movement plan is based on the ground tactical and landing plans. It specifies the schedule and provides instructions for air movement of troops, equipment, and supplies from PZs to LZs. 14-5 The loading plan is based on the air movement plan and ensures that troops, equipment, and supplies are loaded on the correct aircraft. Unit integrity is maintained when aircraft loads are planned. Cross-loading may be necessary to ensure survivability of mission command assets and that the mix of weapons arriving at the LZ is ready to fight. 14-6 The staging plan is based on the loading plan. It prescribes the arrival time of ground units, troops, equipment, and supplies at the PZ in the order of movement. Selection and marking of pickup and landing zones. 14-7. Small unit leaders should consider the size, surface conditions, ground slope, obstacles, and the approach and departure when selecting a PZ or LZ. A minimal circular landing point separation from other aircraft and obstacles is needed. The sizes for the aircraft are OH-6A, 25 meters, AH-1, 35 meters, UH-60 Lima, and AH-64, 50 meters, cargo helicopters, 80 meters, any helicopter with a sling load, 100 meters. 14-8, surface conditions should avoid potential hazards such as sand, blowing dust, snow, tree stumps, or large rocks. Ground slope is another concern that affects landing. The degree of slope for landing is 0-6% to land up slope. 7 to 15 percent land side slope, over 15 percent equals no touchdown. Aircraft may hover. 14-9. When planning the approach and departure of the PZ and LZ, an obstacle clearance ratio of 10 to 1 is used. For example, a tree that is 10 feet tall requires 100 feet of horizontal distance for approach or departure. Mark obstacles with a red chemical light at night or red panels in the daytime. Avoid using markings if the enemy would see them. 14-10. Approach and depart facing into the wind and along the lawn axis of the PZ or LZ. The greater the load, the larger the PZ or LZ is in order to accommodate the insertion or extraction. The PZ and LZ are marked in different ways depending on if it is day or night. For example, day. A ground guide marks the PZ or LZ for the lead aircraft by holding an M4 rifle over his head, by displaying a folded VS-17 panel, chest high, or by other coordinated and identifiable means. Night. The code letter Y, inverted Y, is used to mark the landing point of the lead aircraft at night. See figure 14-1. Chem lights or beanbag lights are used to maintain light discipline. 
A swinging chem light may also be used to mark the landing point. Air assault formations, 14-11. Aircraft supporting an operation may use any of the following PZ and LZ configurations. See table 14-1. These are prescribed by the Air Assault Task Force, commander working with the Air Mission Commander. Table 14-1, Air Assault Formations. Formation, heavy left or heavy right. Pros, provides firepower to front and flank. Cons, requires a relatively long, wide landing area. Presents difficulty in pre-positioning loads. Restricts suppressive fire by inboard gunners. Formation, diamond. Pros, allows rapid deployment for all-round security. Requires only a small landing area. Cons, presents some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. Restricts suppressive fire of inboard gunners. Formation, V. Pros, requires a relatively small landing area. Allows rapid deployment of forces to the front. Cons, present some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. Formation, echelon left or echelon right. Allows rapid deployment of forces to the flank. Allows unrestricted suppressive fire by gunners. Cons, present some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. Requires a relatively long, wide landing area. Formation, trail. Pros, requires a relatively small landing area. Allows rapid deployment of forces to the flank. Simplifies pre-positioning of loads. Allows unrestricted suppressive fire by gunners. Cons. Requires a long landing area. Formation. Staggered trail left or right. Pros. Simplifies pre-positioning of loads. Allows rapid deployment for all-around security. Cons. Requires a relatively long, wide landing area. Somewhat restricts gunners suppressive fire. 14-12. The positive aspect of a heavy left or heavy right formation, see figure 14-2, is that it provides firepower to the front and flank. However, this formation requires a relatively long and wide landing area, presents difficulty in pre-positioning loads, and restricts suppressive fire by inboard gunners. 14-13. The diamond formation, see figure 14-3, allows rapid deployment for all-around security. Although it requires a small landing area, the diamond formation presents some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. It also restricts suppressive fire by inboard gunners. 14-14. The V formation, see figure 14-4, also requires a relatively small landing area and allows the rapid deployment of forces to the front. It restricts suppressive fire of inboard gunners and presents some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. 14-15. The echelon left or right formation, see figure 14-5, allows rapid deployment of forces to the flank and unrestricted suppressive fires by gunners. It also requires a relatively long and wide landing area that presents some difficulty in pre-positioning loads. 14-16. The trail formation requires a relatively small landing area and allows rapid deployment of forces to the flank. It also simplifies pre-positioning loads and allows unrestricted suppressive fire by gunners. 14-17. A staggered trail left or right formation, see figures 14-7, requires a relatively long and wide landing area and the gunner suppressive fire is somewhat restricted. It simplifies pre-positioning loads and allows rapid deployment for all-around security. Pickup Zone Operations, 14-18. Prior to the arrival of aircraft, the PZ is secured. The PZ control party is positioned and the troops and equipment are positioned in the platoon and squad assembly areas. In occupying a patrol and squad assembly area, the patrol or squad leader maintains all-around security of the assembly area, maintains communications, organizes personnel and equipment into chalks and loads, and conducts safety briefings and equipment checks of the troops. 14-19. Figure 14-8 shows an example of a large, one-sided PZ. Figures 14-9 through 14-12 on pages 4-12 through 14-15 demonstrate loading and unloading procedures and techniques. CH-47 CV-22 Rear Ramp Offload 14-20 In the rear ramp offload method, soldiers exit from the rear ramp of a CH-47 or a Chinook or other rear exiting aircraft. Soldiers move out from the aircraft and drop to a prone fighting position, establishing 360 security until the aircraft lifts to depart the LZ. See figure 14-13. Once the aircraft departs the LZ, the unit may execute a one- or two-sided LZ rush according to the landing plan or SOPs. 14-21. In this method, soldiers exit from the rear ramp of the CH-47 or other rear exiting aircraft. Soldiers move out from the aircraft and drop to a prone fighting position, establishing 360-degree security until the aircraft lifts to depart the LZ. Once the aircraft departs the LZ, the unit may execute a one- or two-sided LZ rush according to the landing plan or SOPs. 14-22 Safety is the primary concern of all leaders when operating in and around aircraft. The inclusion of aircraft in arranger operations brings high risks. Consider the following U-860 Lima. Approach the aircraft from 45 to 90 degrees of the, off the nose. 
Point the muzzles of weapons upward when loaded with blank firing adapters. Point the muzzles of weapons downward when loaded with live ammunition. Wear the ballistic helmet. When possible, conduct an air crew safety brief with all personnel. At a minimum, cover loading and offloading, emergency and egress procedures. Leaders carry a manifest and turn in a copy to higher headquarters. Requirements 14 23. Minimum landing space requirements and minimum distance between helicopters on the ground depend on many factors. If the aviation unit SOP does not spell out these requirements, the aviation unit commander works with the Pathfinder leader. The final decision about minimum landing requirements rests with the aviation unit commander. In selecting helicopter landing sites for maps, aerial photographs, and actual ground or aerial reconnaissance, consider the following factors. Number of helicopters. To land a large number of helicopters at the same time, the commander might have to provide another landing site nearby. Alternatively, land the helicopters at the same site but in successive lifts. Landing formations. Helicopter pilots should try to match the landing formation to the flight formation. Pilots should have to modify their formations no more than necessary to accommodate the restrictions of a landing site. However, in order to land in a restrictive area, they might have to modify the formation. Surface conditions. Rangers choose landing sites that have firm surfaces. This prevents helicopters from bogging down, creating excessive dust or blowing snow. Rotor wash stirs up any loose dirt, sand, or snow. This can obscure the ground, especially at night. Rangers remove these and any other debris from the landing point since airborne debris could damage the rotor blades or turbine engines. Ground slope. Rangers choose landing sites with relatively level ground. For the helicopter to land safely, the slope should not exceed 7 degrees. Whenever possible, pilots should land upslope rather than downslope. All helicopters can land where ground slope measures 7 degrees or less. Day operation signals. For daylight operations, use different smoke colors for each landing site. The same color can be used more than once. Just spread them out. Use smoke only when necessary, because the enemy can see it too. Try to use it only when the pilot asks for help locating the helicopter site. Night operation signals. For night operations, use pyrotechnics or other visual signals in lieu of smoke. As in daylight, red signals mean do not land, but they can also be used to indicate other emergency conditions. Everyone plans and knows emergency codes. Each flight lands at the assigned site according to the messages and the visual aids displayed. Arm and hand signals can be used to help control landing, hovering, and parking of helicopters. Planning Considerations 14-24 To ensure success of the ground mission, leaders plan their own missions in detail. The more time they have to make the plans, the more detailed plans they can make. As soon as the senior leader receives word of a pending operation, a mission alert is issued, immediately followed with a warning order. Just enough information is issued to allow the subordinate leaders to start preparing for their operation. This includes Roll Call, Enemy and Friendly Situations in Brief, Mission, Chain of Command and Task Organization, Individual Uniform and Equipment, Required equipment, work priorities, specific instructions, attached personnel, coordination times. 14-25. On receiving the alert or warning order, leaders inspect and augment personnel and equipment as needed. Leaders prepare equipment in the following order, from the most to least important. Radios, navigation aids, weapons, essential individual equipment, assembly aids, other items as needed. 14-26. To succeed in operation has security. Each person receives only the information necessary to complete each phase of the operation. For example, the commander isolates any soldiers who know the details of the operation. The situation dictates the extent of security requirements. Rotary Wing Aircraft Specifications 14-27 Rotary Wing Aircraft are vital for the success of certain missions. The Army relies on different types. UH-60 Lima Blackhawk, CV-22 Osprey, and the CH-47 Delta Chinook. 14-28 when fitted with a sling load, the Chinook technical data package is number 5, 100 meter diameter. Without the sling load, it is number 4, 80 meter diameter. Specifications for all three helicopters are in the following tables. Table 14-2, specifications for the U-860 Lima Blackhawk. Optics. Pilots use AN or AVS-6 to fly the aircraft at night. Navigation equipment. Doppler navigation set or GPS. Flight characteristics. Max speed. 156 knots, normal cruise speed 120 to 145 knots, maximum speed with external sling loads 90 knots. Additional capabilities. External store support system allows for extended operations without refueling, more than 5 hours, with two 230 gallon fuel tanks. It also allows configuration for ferry and self-deployment flights with four 230 gallon fuel tanks. Enhanced mission command, Console provides the maneuver commander with an airborne platform that can support six secure VHF radios, one HF radio, two VHF radios, and two ultra-high frequency radios. 
U-860 Lima is capable of inserting and extracting troops with fast rope infiltration, exfiltration system, and special purpose infiltration exfiltration systems. Sling load lift rating of 9,000 pounds. Table 14-3. Specifications for the CV-22 Osprey. Weapon system and ranges. M2 50 caliber machine gun, 1800 meters. Communication equipment. Internal and AIC-30 external ARC-210 radio. Navigation aid. ARN-147. Flight characteristics. Cruise speed, 240 knots. Max airspeed, 250 knots at sea level and 305 knots at 15,000 feet. Payload, 24 troops seated, 32 troops floor loaded or 10,000 pounds cargo. Endurance, 500 nautical miles with troops. Aircraft survivability equipment. Radar warning receiver. AN-APR-39 Alpha, version 2. Laser warning. AN-AVR-2 Alpha laser detection system. Missile warning. AN-AAR-47. Electronic countermeasures. ALE-47 countermeasures dispensing system. Fuel capacity, 2,025 gallons. Other capabilities, self-deployable, vertical, or short takeoff and landing. Table 14-4. Specifications for the CH-47 Delta Chinook. Optics. Pilots use AN-AVS-6 to fly the aircraft at night. Navigation equipment. Doppler navigation set or GPS. Flight characteristics. Max speed level 170 knots. Normal cruise speed 130 knots. Additional capabilities. Can be configured with additional fuel for mobile forward arming refueling equipment system or for ferry and self-deployment missions. Has an internal load winch to ease loading of properly configured cargo. Can sling load virtually any piece of equipment in light infantry, airborne or air assault divisions. Capacity. Carries 33 to 55 troops, 24 litters, and 3 attendants or 28,000 pounds of cargo. End chapter 14. All right, that's it for chapter 14, aviation, another short one. And after this episode, we only have one left, which is chapter 15, first aid. So I don't know about you, I'm pretty excited though. It's been a long time coming, so I hope you join us next time for the conclusion of the Ranger Handbook. Uh, And in the meantime, check out armyflashcards.com.